Hello and welcome to the third and final webinar in our Patient and Family Engagement Series. The topic is Building and Sustaining Organizational Demand for Patient and Family Advisor Engagement, Internal Marketing, Project Development, Staff Engagement and Support, and Sharing Appreciation and Outcomes. My name is Jill Lindwall, a Clinical Quality Improvement Advisor at the Wisconsin Hospital Association, and I am happy to introduce our presenter, Jenna Wright. Jenna is the Program Manager for Patient and Family Advisory Partnerships at UW Health and has gained extensive experience engaging patients and families in improvement work at a large academic medical facility. She came into this role in 2017 with over 20 years of experience in adult education, training in academic and business environments, focusing on spoken and written communication. Her passions include health literacy, human connections in healthcare, and patient and family engagement in all aspects of healthcare design and delivery. Thank you for being here, Jenna. Thanks, Jill. Um, so thank you everyone for joining for this uh, last webinar. And um, today, as Jill said, we are gonna focus on how to engage your organization in um, PFA um, participating work. So the last uh, two webinars that we did were focusing more on how to get um, advisors into your um, organization. So we looked at recruitment and all of the things following that, including screening, interviewing, and then keeping track of all that information. And then we talked about um, really onboarding, including orientation and placement, how to keep those valuable patient family advisors, and then um, some ideas for recognition. And today we're going to look at um, really the organizational engagement component, including how to spread the word about the good work that advisors can do through internal marketing, um, how to partner with staff so you can develop um, high-quality projects that meet the needs of the organization, um, how to engage um, staff to, um, to fully utilize the talents of the advisor and support them along their journey, and then um, collecting and sharing appreciation and outcomes to further promote the work. So that's what we're going to do today. Thanks for joining me again. And thanks to the Wisconsin Hospital Association for sponsoring the webinar. So just to back it up a little bit, I always start with where am I coming from? So UW Health is a large academic medical center um, system, actually, with um, one, two, three, four, five, seven hospitals and 87 outpatient clinics and serving a large population base of around 600,000 um, patients. Um, and then we have lots of uh, clinics and other joint, adventure, joint ventures and affiliations. So you can kind of see that. Um, and the work that I do is mostly centered around our Madison operations, um, but it does cover all of our um, hospitals and clinics. And as you can see, we do have a large um, staffing pool. So we have around, well, we have over 20,000 staff. And as you can imagine, communicating anything um, with this number of staff can be challenging. So if you're trying to spread the word about, um, for example, in my case, our patient family advisor program, it can be a little daunting to know how to start because the organization is so large and everyone here um, is focused on their work really directly um, impacting patients in their roles. And so taking a step out of that and thinking how can I engage an advisor um, really does require some, some prompting. So I have multiple strategies that I use to engage um, as many people as I can in this work, and I'll share some of those ways that I, um, that I do that with you guys in a couple minutes. Um, first of all, I think it's good to start with a really strong definition of what a patient family advisor program is. And if you've heard the other webinars, you may know that I kind of use two working definitions. One of these um, was the one created by the patient family advisors, which is um, working as partners, UW Health and Patient Family Advisors seek to transform healthcare delivery by providing a forum for the patients and families' voices to be heard and understood. I love this definition. It was written by PFAs. Um, it does capture their understanding of their work. But when I talk to staff, um, that's a little bit wordy for some staff. And it also doesn't use kind of the business um, and improvement language jargon that we kind of have. So for staff, if I'm doing a presentation for them, I usually use this verbiage, which is that the PFA program is UW Health structured program for patients and families to engage as stakeholders in improving quality, safety, and patient experience. So those little buzzwords mean a lot to staff, but not much to patients and families. So I think it's important to have definitions that um, reflect your audience. So again, when I talk to staff, I use this second um, definition. And I always show the benefits of um, 
engaging patient family advisors in that they bring a fresh perspective to the work. Um, they are not supervised by anyone who works for us. They don't have a budget. They don't have any prior experiences um, with the, that probably that work specifically from the work side. Um, they do keep the human side of healthcare present in the decisions that are made in whatever form they're in. And then importantly, they share with us their entire journey, um, which includes how well we work together and can help us see beyond our own silos. So staff specifically can relate to this last um, bullet point is that they honestly sometimes don't know what happens before the patient meets them or after the patient leaves them. And so patient family advisors can bring that full perspective. Um, and we learn a lot by just asking questions and working with advisors. Um, and you can see in one of my favorite quotes there that one of our patient family advisors shared that really her, the benefit to her is that she's been able to share stories about how her daughter's health and well-being was impacted, again, the human side, opposed to, um, which is a, a little bit different from how a system might look in a flow chart. And we really need to keep that front and center in all of our work. So when I do um, presentations to staff, I always show these two slides so that they can see um, you know, the benefits of the Patient Family Advisor Program, and then hopefully they'll find a reason to um, engage them. So speaking of presentations, um, we're going to move into the how do I get the word out section of this presentation. And I have lots of ways that I promote the Patient Family Advisor Program. Um, one of them is through direct contact, so in-person presentations, which I like to call roadshows, which means I might try to get on someone's agenda and share information about the program. Um, generally, these are 15-minute presentations where I go over um, what we offer, some of the benefits, some testimonials, um, and then inviting further contact. So this is just a way to build awareness. Um, these have been seen by groups of employee advisors, our improvement advisors, which are housed in our quality department, um, and some managers and our volunteer services department. And then I'll go on anyone's agenda. So uh, if, if I get an invitation, I'm there, and I want to share and spread the word about our fantastic program. And a lot of times people may have heard of it because we do have um, many places where this appears and brief mentions. So at new employee orientation, new leader orientation, and then anytime um, my leaders discuss what they offer from our department offerings, this is presented as well. So they might have a passing understanding, um, and but the the, you know, the road show, the big presentation, really helps people get a deep understanding. Um, so that's just one way that I, I spread the word. Now, of course, with 20,000 staff, I can't meet many many person many people in person. So this is not um, probably as broadly effective as I would like. I'm kind of a people person. I wouldn't mind um, meeting everyone in the organization, but it's not really super effective. So we also have a fantastic intranet site, so our internal internet. Um, and on that site, I have a lot of information about the program, but also featuring some um, staff testimonials about how they've benefited from having patients um, involved in their work. And sometimes, um, you know, it's high-level leaders, like in this case, a vice president, where we worked with patient family advisors to develop our strategic planning for the five-year um, planning process. Um, and sometimes it's a, you know, person. This, in this case, um, this individual was helping to develop the strategic planning for our oncology um, operation. And her her testimonial at the bottom there, being surrounded by patients and family members who understand what it's like for someone battling cancer was a unique experience for me. And I think when she was doing her planning work um, with oncology, that that was something that stuck with her and probably informed some decision-making. Um, I know it did inform her some of their decision-making for the strategic planning. So, um, and then I have a couple more here. Um, so, again, and there are literally like hundreds of these that I have. So I try to feature some of these on the website just to show um, how staff may have peers that have engaged patient family advisors and the kind of work and the quality of the work that they've done. So I think, um, you know, I try to refresh that every once in a while, but it's good just to have some, some good staff testimonials so you can build um, awareness and maybe drive demand. Another part of my um, marketing, internal marketing uh, strategy is to, uh, I have this general page on my, on my internet site 
And again, um, this one invites um, more contact with the department. It invites people to help recruit new patient family advisors by displaying a flyer, um, contacting me. There's an interest form that they can um, submit to either nominate or um, have someone apply. And then to request PFA involvement or get on one of the agendas for the patient family advisor council um, that we have. Um, they can also request a speaker. So there's a lot of ways that we try to get um, staff to engage with us. And sometimes people, um, sometimes people do contact me through the, one of these forms online, but sometimes they just email me or call me. So I'm the only person um, kind of running this program right now, so it's pretty easy to figure out who to call. But in case, um, in case things change, you know, this has gone through a couple different hands over the years, um, it's important to have general contact routes so that people can definitely contact the program anytime. So this um, internal marketing uh, through our intranet um, is pretty effective. I think that, um, you know, people are driven there through a number of links, um, whether it's when we have um, something that appears, again, through our intranet on like a, or our tip series or something like that, then there's always a link to our patient family advisor program, so then they're driven back to that page. Um, so another way that I keep the program top of mind is to periodically publish things that involve patient family advisor um, input. So this one, it actually is, comes from our patient family experience department, and they have, they asked me to, to survey our advisors and ask them what kinds of um, UW Health uh, jargon or lingo is confusing to you. And boy, we got a ton of great responses. So we picked the best ones and published it as a, a tip to staff to avoid or define um, jargon. And those stories, I think, are very compelling. And so it had a dual purpose of, you know, it, letting our staff know what patient family advisors think about the use of jargon as the content, but also um, you can, at the bottom of this form, which you can't see, there's some suggestion for inviting PFA contact for anyone who would read it. So it's a little bit of a promotion and a little bit of a, um, you know, a bit of content for our staff. So we're often involved in these tips. We also often have um, social media posts. This one was out on our UW Health Facebook um, page for a while, and now it's stored on my um, website, my external facing website. Um, and so this was one of our advisors um, was happy to share her story for World Stroke Day, and she also sits on the UW Health uh, Patient Family Advisory Council. And so down in there, um, which you can't see, is a link to the program again. So the people who might see it on Facebook would click on that link and then be rerouted to the Patient Family Advisor Program. So again, just very kind of sneaky ways to get um, you know links into content that's outgoing for another purpose. And the last one here is a, this was a blog um, that was on our uh, our American Family Children's Hospital website. Again, um, Radhika there is another one of our advisors sharing a story about her son and their care. And somewhere in there it says that she's a patient family advisor. So again, if I can sneak that in, I certainly will. It's a way to market both internally and externally, but just keeping um, patient family advisor work top of mind. Okay. Um, still on the marketing theme, um, how do we share the word? Um, there's an obviously we have our um, intranet. We also have physical things like posters and postcards, um, and then versions of that that are digital that go up on our LCD screens or digital signage. Um, this postcard uh, does it is really patient facing. It says your input is invited, but these are um, placed around many different um, clinics and sites. Staff see them too, so they might. Uh, be curious and pick that up, and then that might initiate some contact into my program. Um, and I also am happy to send these out to any staff who request them so that they can help recruit advisors. So it's kind of nice to have the physical things. I wouldn't say it drives a lot of demand or business my way, but it's good just to have that out there more as a top of mind thing. Um, so this is the official form for getting a patient family advisor request. So let's say um, a staff member has a committee or a project that they're trying to work on. Um, they can go to our internal intranet page and request a patient family advisor to join their project. Um, and this always is followed up by a phone call because there's no, really not a way that the form can capture um, all the information I would need, but it's a good starting point. So 
they would fill this out. I call them and say, what are you trying to do? How can I help? And then we'll talk about all the specifics after that. But this is one way, although I think I've gotten two of these this year, but like dozens of requests through direct contact. So this is if somebody doesn't know who the, you know who I am. So that's, that's fine. It's good to have these duplicate ways of getting in touch with the program. So this is a kind of effective. I would say that it's, an, it's necessary, again, if you if you are, if people may not know who you are. Okay. So, and my, I think this is the key. I have a key there because I want to remind myself that I think the key to really driving um, demand in the organization is to have leaders and other staff members, oops, promote the program with the people that they're working with. And so I just want to take a minute to share a little bit how my program is embedded in the organization. So the Patient Family Advisor Program is housed in Patient Family Experience. Um, and in Patient Family Experience, we um, really work with, we have a group of advisors, uh, Patient Family Experience advisors, who connect with leaders across the organization to help them improve their, maybe their survey scores or solve some problem that they're working on related to patient experience. So they have tons of contact with clinic managers, nurse managers, providers, um, people who are trying to solve problems, work on things, and then they can say, hey, I see you're working on this issue. Do you think you could benefit from patient family advisor input? So that's one way is that they'll go, um, they'll, in, their, in the course of their work, drive business to my office. And um, our, the patient family experience department is housed in performance excellence, which is um, kind of the more, more, more or less quality. So if it's kind of our quality department, and patient performance excellence has a number of improvement advisors. And again, improvement advisors have relationships with people through the organization to develop improvement projects. Um, and then a lot of that would involve, hopefully, patient family advisors um, if, they, if it's at a point where that would be a benefit. So the, the people who I work with are great marketers for the patient family advisor program because they're always out there talking about um, you know, how, what a benefit it is to have the patient's voice in the projects. So that's the key, I think. So I, I kind of hinted at this, but um, uh, UW Health has a um, pretty well-established improvement methodology, and um, it's, it's called Focus PDCA, so you may be familiar with this. So we have a problem-solving methodology where we find a process to improve, organize a team, clarify the current state of the issue, understand variation, select the improvement, plan, do the improvement, check the results, act, and determine next steps. So this is probably not new to most of you, but I picked up on this, like, hey, you're going to organize a team of people who know about this issue. So the team is any stakeholder, could be staff, could be patient, could be downstream um, customer, anyone who would be part of the process of the problem or the issue that you're talking about. So the team... Um, could include a patient family advisor. So in all of our documentation about our improvement methodology, we do have references to and links to our patient family advisor program. So under the O of organize a team, um, there's a link to the patient family advisor page. And that way, you know, if people are trying to make, um, you know, I don't know, do a root cause analysis or do, uh, you know, some sort of um, process where they're trying to figure out what's going on, or really decide on a solution or even try things, even gather data, we can engage patient family advisors um, in some of those efforts. So I would say that's another key, if I could put another key up there, I would, um, to try to get patient family advisors um, kind of as a part of the, the everyday work of the organization is to get it into your improvement methodology and set up to connect people directly from that to your office. Okay, so now moving into, so now we've covered like all the various ways that I try to market the program. And once someone contacts me, it's usually a conversation about um, really how to engage patient family advisors in the work. And this is like a one slide um, overview of how I advise people and when to involve patient family advisors. So I always say that it should improve, it should involve a patient experience touch point which is anything uh, related to people, the place, or the process um, of the work that touches a patient experience. Um, and 
so for example, you know, anything around education, marketing, signage, facilities, workflow that affects patients, staff behavior and communication, like those are all patient experience touch points. I'll give you an example of um, a project that didn't have a patient experience touch point, but uh, we kind of had to talk about this one. So it was in one of in our infection control committees, there are processes that touch patients, like communication around um, gloving and gowning, around isolation precautions, those things, and, and signage and all of that does involve a patient touch point. But some of the things around infection control, including like products, you know, procedures that staff do don't involve patient touch points, so that's not a good place to engage an advisor. So maybe, um, you know, if a patient family advisor is on a committee like that, they wouldn't attend the meetings related to you know, the products and the procedure that staff do, but they would attend the meetings that involve things related to communication, signage, um, that kind of thing. So that's uh, one of the big things. Um, also, key there, and in italics, is decisions have yet to be made. So if it's done, it's really not a good time to engage advisors. Um, I did get a request recently where someone said, I hope they like it because we're kind of done. And I'm like, well, that may not be a great topic for a patient family advisor because if they have suggestions and you say, well, I'm not willing to make changes, then why are we inviting the advisors into this process? So I think it's important to get advisors in early so that um, there's an opportunity for their input to make a difference. I don't think that I would keep very many advisors if they were only there to give feedback on things that never made a difference. Um, in that vein, uh, patient family advisors should be engaged to brainstorm new ideas, um, react to concepts, maybe select from different options or suggest changes. Um, and they should not just have, um, they should not be there just to listen without the opportunity to contribute. So that would exclude things like ed education. So sometimes we have people who want to present at meetings where they say, let me share my information about X. And that's the end of the story. So that is not a good opportunity for a patient family advisor to be engaged because they don't have an opportunity to give feedback. Um, that's not what we're there for. We're also not an approving body, so we don't just say, I like your idea, check, right? So we're not a rubber stamp um, organization. So we really want it to be a rich involvement where patient family advisors get to um, have a two-way two conversation with our staff and involve and get their opinions in there and uh, use their experiences to inform improvements. And then of course, I have down at the bottom there, patient family advisors should not monopolize meeting time for their own personal agendas or reflections. And that's just um, mostly for staff to say, hey, this is, don't feel like you have to, um, you don't feel like you have to let your meeting be derailed by one person who's not on, not doing what they're supposed to be doing. And it's okay to say, let me talk to you about that afterwards. Um, I just want to make sure that we get this decision made today or whatever. Um, so I try to give staff a little bit of education about when it's a good time to involve patient family advisors and how, um, and then a little bit of like what not to do. So that's just my one slide um, overview about that. But again, um, these are almost always conversations. I can share what other people have learned. Um, I can share what I've learned and then we make a plan from there. Okay, so once we get a project going, um, this you might have seen something like this before if you watched the other webinars. This is a little bit of my tracking sheet. So these are um, columns that would belong to an enormous Excel spreadsheet. Um, and in this, I just want to point out that I, I have activity types um, and terms, and I have all the notes about the purpose and the advisors confirmed and that kind of a thing. And this guides me through the conversations that I have with staff so that I can get the right um, matches for their project. Um, and sometimes if they have a purpose, uh, any given purpose can have a number of different activity types associated with it. So um, I'll give you some examples of times when we, we had some conversations about um, maybe the original purpose uh, led to it had a natural um, PFA feedback mechanism. Here are some of the types of projects that have, um, that PFAs can contribute to. It could be facility design, improvement work group, focus group, which are usually one-time um, ad hoc meetings. Um, we can do electronic surveys. We can have advisory councils, which are um, standing meetings that usually focus on a similar topic or facility. 
PFA is an assignment is our volunteer arm, um, of course, standing committees, which are mostly staff, and a couple of patient family advisors, and then Voices of UW Health is our patient um, speakers bureau. So for a given purpose, they might select, they might have an idea that they want a survey, but maybe a focus group is better, or they might want to join a PFAC meeting, but the timing doesn't work out for their project. So we'll say, can I make a focus group for you? Or um, they might have a standing improvement work group, but they never considered inviting a patient family advisor. And they want to do a survey, and I'm like, well, do you have an advisor on your work group? So maybe there are conversations to be had um, to develop the project in the right way based on the number of choices that we have for engaging um, PFAs. So here are some um, kind of recent projects. And if you look at the activity type, which is the third column, you'll see lots of different activity types. So voices, which is our speakers bureau focus group, more voices, improvement work group, a couple surveys there. And, um, you know, there may have been more than one way to meet these needs. So the delirium patient stories for nursing education was a videotaping. Uh, that's probably only going to be appropriate for a speakers bureau. But the um, homepage, my chart homepage redesign could be a survey, could be a focus group, could be a PFAC meeting, just depends on the timing and the nature of the work. Um, Faces of Patients is an in-person speaking engagement, so that's only appropriate for that. Um, readmissions from skilled nursing facility work group, that was a work group of staff that wanted to involve a patient family advisor, um, and that's probably the way to do that. Um, but they could have maybe done a, um, I don't know, they could have maybe done a testimonial from a patient or something like that as well. The um, burn, burn unit bath murals was an online survey. But this one I'll say was a little unusual because we had a group of patient family advisors um, voting for murals to appear in the bathing rooms of our burn unit. And they had, none of them were, had ever been burn patients. And so we didn't maybe have the right group of, of advisors for that. Um, so then we took it back and the, the nursing staff really heavily influenced this more than maybe the advisors because they were the ones who worked with the patients who would be in those rooms. Um, so we, we tried to have patient family advisor input, but maybe it wasn't the best choice. Um, and that, again, I didn't organize that one specifically, but it was just good to kind of see that maybe nursing um, input was heavier and they could interview patients on the unit rather than invite um, outsiders who had never been a burn patient into the process. And then you saw the results of the UW Health Jargon um, online survey, which produced that tips page. Um, here's just a few more. Looking down that third column, we have uh, currently openings for our Behavioral Health uh, Patient Family Advisory Council, where we did some tours for our facility redesign, um, actually facility design of our new East Campus that is under in the planning process. Um, the TLC Mobilization Current and Future State Mapping followed the, the next one there, the TLC Mobilization Patient Interviews. Patient Interviews was a volunteer project. Um, advisors went up on the, our um, intensive care unit and interviewed patients about their experiences mobilizing um, with all the gear involved in being an ICU patient. Um, and then they used that information in that current and future state mapping improvement work group. So we were part of that process really from beginning to end. And then as they um, try out some of their proposed solutions, they may invite for more, they may invite more interviews or more involvement in a work group as that project moves on. Um, all right, so I don't need to go over all these, but you can kind of see the variety of projects that are in the portfolio and the kind, kinds of different activities. Um, more focus groups, standing committees, work groups. We could do this all day. I have like 100 things in my project list right now. So, But I love this. It just shows how, um, how fantastically engaging the organization is for PFAs, and we can be creative. So, um, you know, we can have... When this program first started 10 years ago, we only had patient family advisory councils. And then it was a real stretch to get patients involved into committee work. And now we're doing all this online surveys and um, more volunteer work, like the communication advisor program, second to the bottom, is so innovative. Patient family advisors observe doctors and give them feedback on their communication skills. That's awesome. So the program has matured over the last 15 years or so from being very maybe reluctant to involve patient family advisors into like, hey, let's have them follow us around. 
Like, this is fantastic. So if you're in the beginning stages of your um, PFA journey, have a target for, you know, more, more and more integration into your operations, um, and you'll kind of reap the benefits of that um, throughout many different uh, project, um, projects and activities. Okay, so uh, now staff engagement and support. Um, there are lots of ways that the, the office, um, the Patient Family Advisor Program office supports staff in um, working with patient family advisors. Some of them may have, again, that reluctance to invite people and they want a lot of structure around what they're trying to do. Um, some of them are more familiar with how it works and don't need as much support. So as it's needed, I will provide um, the kind of support that people are asking for. One way to support is just to provide some basic templates. Um, we have a charter template for advisory councils. So I have right now three proposed councils that are trying to start up. Um, and they all have this blank charter and they have to take it back to their staff groups and fill it out and figure out what their purpose is, when they want to meet, how many advisors they want, what their, who their executive sponsor is, um, how they're going to engage PFAs and their membership terms and all of that stuff. So that's just something that they would work on themselves and then bring it back to me. And then that helps them think through their goals um, and really how they're going to structure their, their meeting. So I have a few of those out. Also, um, we provide job descriptions if they want that level of structure for um, PFAC members or committee members. Um, and so you can kind of see that there are terms listed there and then some details about the logistics, qualifications, and then the expectations of the role. That's both for the um, patient family advisor and for the staff person to really get a sense of how it works to partner with the patient family advisor. And another form I offer is just our um, feedback form for meetings. I, did, I think it's really important that we get patient feedback at all steps of their engagement with us, including the meetings that they attend. So we'll solicit feedback um, and then review it and see if we need to make changes to our meeting structure based on their feedback. So these are just three of the templates that I would provide. Um, I actually have a whole toolkit online that people can browse. Um, it's our, on our internal site if they are looking for something specific, but I can help create new things if they wanted to. Another um, level of staff engagement and support is our um, Patient Family Advisory Council Coordinating Committee. So again, councils are groups of 12 to 18 advisors that focus on a specific topic. Um, they, there are 12 in the, in the UW Health System. We have like UW Health, uh, PFAC, Oncology, Children's Hospital, Heart Vascular Thoracic, Transplant, um, Cystic Fibrosis, and a few other ones. And so these groups have each a chair, uh, which is a staff person, and a co-chair, which is a patient family advisor. And they're all, each uh, staff and PFA co-chair are invited to attend a quarterly meeting, um, which is just one hour out of their lives, so four hours a year. But we really do um, accomplish a lot in these brief meetings. Our purpose is to connect and share best practices around engaging advisors. We have a standing agenda in which each PFAC um, shares out their meeting highlights from the previous quarter. So it's a, it's a one hour meeting, so they really can't talk about their whole quarter. They can pick one or two topics that were um, really highlights. Um, and then I'll record that in the minutes and that kind of serves as a record of um, accomplishments. And then I will share out some program updates um, you know, what's going on with the program as far as numbers and any big milestones that we're hitting as a patient family advisor program. And then generally I will lead a discussion where we talk about a best practice topic, like how to recruit for diversity, um, meeting management strategies, um, best practices for recognizing patient family advisors or whatever is top of mind for that quarter. So I will show you one example um, of a time when I shared our our PFA annual survey feedback, and I sent all this in advance. So I sent the feedback and I sent the questions, and then I asked those two questions, um, both in the, you know, it let, let them preview the questions, and then we talked about it when they got there. So I'll just show you some of our annual um, survey feedback. So I think I might have shared this in a previous webinar, but this is something you can't really read, but it's like how to, um, the question was rate your experience as an advisor in the last 12 months, um, and then the questions follow here. So how, 
asked, how well did you feel welcome and respected? Um, and then there are comments. And so I shared all the comments. And I bolded some things that I thought were important. So warmth from each advisor, good and responsive groups, love the communication advisor program, UW Health staff um, makes PFAs feel welcome, um, and they're thanked for being there. So that's what they said about how they felt welcomed and respected. Um, this feedback was about whether their role as a PFA was clear to staff. One person said it took a couple meetings. Um, one person said they wish they had more of an idea of what to expect. One person praised um, some of the people that they had worked with. And then this question was whether they had enough time, whether their meetings had enough time for patient family advisory input. One person said it was perfect. Some said it was too big. Some said two hours is too long. There never seems to be enough time. Usually have more, more to cover than time allowed. So that might lead to some meeting management, um, you know, talks. Wish we could meet more frequently, that kind of thing. Um, I felt prepared for the role. Some people said absolutely. Some people said I never know what's going to happen before I get there. So there's a little bit of variation in their feedback on that. So um, talking about, and we had looked at this all before. So I said, what do you see? Like what, what stands out to you? Or what are some takeaways for your group? And I just asked those two questions, and they came back, the co-chairs came back with their own takeaways. So they said from all that information that they need to do a better job of creating a warm social environment. And then we talked about, well, how do you do that? Well, some people said they didn't know who was sitting around the table. So we talked about make sure, making sure that everyone has a name tent that's visible to all the other meeting participants. It's a really basic meeting management strategy, but some people had overlooked it due to time or they forgot them that day, but it made a difference for that person. We also said include introductions and um, icebreakers when time allows. They, um, that some other takeaways um, included what kinds of icebreaker questions, maybe like share a recent bit of good news, share a joy, as we say. Um, another takeaway was send the agenda early and give a reminder the day ahead or day of the meeting. Because some people like time to prepare, but some people don't they'll forget by the five to seven days, you know, after five days. So a little bit of both um, timing, early agenda, but quick reminder beforehand. And then um, this is critical, of course, ensure each topic has a feedback component where changes can be made by engaging presenters ahead of time. So they found that even though meeting leaders knew how to engage patient family advisors, Sometimes the staff that they were working with really didn't quite know. And so it's really that staff person's obligation to say, can you let me know what you're trying to accomplish? What questions are you going to ask? Um, we'll make sure that we get you the answers that you need. If at that point the staff person says, actually, I just want to give an educational piece, then that's not really a great topic for a meeting. So it would be a good time to switch up the agenda. So again, um, in this uh, coordinating committee meeting, I try not to tell people what to do. I try to just present information and then see if they can draw the conclusions. Um, and then hopefully that would lead to better, um, better meetings, better engagement of patient family advisors. That's one of the ways. Um, oops. Yep, okay. So, uh, and then I also offer a tip sheet for every, um, every new patient family advisor assignment. Um, that goes out to a staff person, they receive a tip sheet on how to, how to create successful partnerships with patient family advisors. And you can see the, the, the tips there, and this was all gleaned from the advisors through their feedback. So they want to know what the purpose of the meeting is. Um, we have to remember that PFAs know all the logistics about how to get to their meeting and that they're communicated with by email, um, generally, because we don't have uh, the same calendar system with PFAs. Um, again, number three, if we change the meeting time, we have to update the PFAs because they're not on our calendar, calendar system. And then sending it information in advance, providing physical copies if you can. Um, and then number six, explain all acronyms, terms, job titles, other phrases that PFAs may not know. Um, and I also encourage PFAs to stop meetings and say, hold on, what was that acronym you just used? I don't I don't follow. And they, hopefully then the, the staff person would be like, oh, yeah, I forgot. <laughs> I'm supposed to explain all that. Um, number seven, encourage PFAs to actively participate in meetings. 
we have had some PFAs say, I don't even know when I should interject my opinion, if it's a whole group of staff. Um, so it's really nice if the facilitator says, you know, we've heard a lot from our staff, what does the, you know, the advisor at the table have to say? Um, number eight, welcome PFA's candid feedback, positive and negative. Um, I never want PFAs to feel like they have to agree with us all the time. Um, the reason we invite them in is because we want their true opinions. So I think that we should just state that outright. And then number nine and ten, follow up and thank PFAs for volunteering. Um, so that's sharing those outcomes and thanking them. So these are all things that they told, that PFAs told us that they want when they're working with us as advisors. So I share that directly with staff. Um, so after, like every year, I contact every staff person who works with a patient family advisor and send something like this email to um, get a note from them to thank the PFA that they worked with and then note any outcomes on the work that they were engaged in. So I ask them to, um, to check that the information that I have is correct and then provide a brief statement of acknowledgement for the PFA that they worked with and then they can mention their specific or general contribution and then any outcomes. And then I give them the clear direction that this will be shared with the advisors directly and may be printed um, in publications that we have or posted on our internet. So I have a form that I ha ask them to fill out because I found out that the more structured it is, the more uh, likely I am to get responses. So I provide everything that I have in the green. So I provide the title of the activity, the purpose, um, the status, uh, if it's in progress or complete, the requesting staff person, um, any advisors I have listed, and then they fill in the blue parts. So what are the outcomes? How did you appreciate the staff, uh, the PFA that you worked with? Um, and then I ask them to list their name and credentials so I can publish it um, in the way that they would want. So sometimes people, their credentials don't appear on their directory listing, so I have to ask about that. And I found that out the hard way, because the first year I did this, I didn't ask for credentials, and I had to send emails back to everybody and say, ooh, do you want me to put your, all your degrees, all those letters behind your name? Um, and then this provides an opportunity for me every year also to correct any information that I may have um, not been informed of. So if the project has completed, they can change in progress to complete. If staff members have turned over and I wasn't informed, I can get that information. So this, I do this every fall. I am going to start next week sending all these out, and then I publish um, the outcomes and appreciations in the appreciation booklet and on our website and for select other publications just to, again, build awareness, drive interest, um, and keep, keep the program moving forward. So all of those things are tracked in my fantastic spreadsheet. Love Excel. So I have, um, for every activity, I have the outcome and appreciation notes listed there as well. And that way, um, actually, it's, I can select the whole column and then manipulate it and send it off to our marketing department, and then they make it beautiful. And it's easy peasy. So again, that was, uh, you've seen this before, this is last year's appreciation booklet, which has the thank yous there. And I send the booklet with this. When I ask for the thank yous, I send the booklet along so they can see examples because I want um, really similar formatting. I need to know in here the title, the people involved, the purpose, and the outcomes. And I want it all in such a way where it's um, third person, so not like thank you for your input, but I give thanks to PFAX for their work and blah, blah, blah. So it's third person. Um, grammar, sorry, I'm a grammar teacher. Anyway. Or was. So uh, so I have a similar format, um, and again, I found this out by doing it the wrong way one year, is I said, let me know how it went with your PFA. It looked really broad directions, and I got a variety of different styles and lengths um, and missing some information, and so I had to be kind of prescriptive in how I collected all of this um, to simplify my life because so many of them come in. So here's one page of, um, I think, four pages like this in the booklet. So that's um, this little booklet that I make every year, is, and I hand this off to every um, new advisor and some people who are new to the program as far as staff as well. Okay, so that kind of sums up my my advice um, as far as using the, the 
organization that you're working with, but I also wanted to share some recommended resources. These are things that have guided me as I've um, learned more about engaging patient and family advisors. So one of my favorite resources is the Plain Tree Patient Preferred Practices um, booklet. This is a PDF, and um, I can't share it directly with you because I believe you have to have a membership to Plain Tree to download this content, but I'm sure many of you listening do. So um, in here are, um, it's a lot of great information about, uh, really it says solutions for making good on the promise of partnering with patients. There are um, self-assessments for advisory council members and for organizational leaders to think how are we doing on our journey to involve patients in our improvement work. Um, so that I highly recommend if you're just starting out or if you want to deepen your understanding um, or just kind of assess where you are. I also really love this one. This is from Institute for, Institute for Patient and Family-Centered Care. It's called Diverse Voices Matter. And a lot of the, this is a, another PDF that you can download if you're an um, IPFCC member. Um, but in here, there are a ton of great strategies for keeping, re recruiting and keeping diverse members, but they re it really helps. You could apply this to anyone. So even if you have a not very diverse group of PFAs, all the techniques here are um, applicable to your group. So it's things like provide a welcoming environment, don't use acronyms, some of the things that we already know. Um, but it's really meeting people where they are, engaging them in the work in a way that they can understand. Perfect. It's fantastic. So I've used this a lot in leading discussions with um, council co-chairs and, you know, kind of guides my perspective as well. Highly recommend that. Another um, fun thing is the Breaking Rules for Better Care. Um, sort of this is a resource guide, but there are activities associated with this. If you Google this from IHI, um, there's some fantastic resources here. And this just asks the question. You're supposed to ask your patients, in our case, patient family advisors, like, if you could change something about healthcare to make it better for you, what would it be? And sometimes you get some things that, re that reveal waste or reveal inefficiencies or reveal um, sort of negative service experiences that are quickly um, maybe fixed. So uh, this was really eye-opening, and I, we, I did this with many of our councils um, a couple years ago, and we came up with just wonderful ideas, and then we sent them off to the maybe the, org, the operational leaders involved as a, hey, this is what your patients are thinking about the process that they're on the receiving end of. So I recommend that. And last thing here is um, anything related to health literacy. One of my favorite um, resources is from Unity Point Health. It's called Building Health Liter Organizations. This is, again, a PDF. This one you can download for free online. And... Um, it's about engaging patients in the work of, um, build, well, many, pro, many um, tips for building health literacy, but also includes engaging patients in reviewing materials that other patients see. So I would highly recommend that. Um, it's another way to meet people where they are. And lastly, um, my favorite website, which has a number of fantastic resources, white papers, um, and also links to um, conferences, pop-up events, is the Barrel Institute. Um, this is a membership organization, but if you, if you are able to get a membership, it does promote all of the great things that we've been talking about this whole time. All right. So I will um, wrap up by saying um, these are the words that UW Health staff use to describe our patient family advisors. I looked through the comments from 2018. Um, from staff to thank patient family advisors, and I pulled out all the descriptive words, and this fantastic list emerged, and there are more, but I picked my favorite ones. And um, really, from this, I, I get the idea that the, the reputation of a patient family advisor program is built on individual relationships between staff and advisors. And that relationship building really can be done best when there's a strong structure and foundation in place um, so that you know, PFAs know what to expect, the organization knows what to expect, and that there is um, both an interest on the patient side and a demand on the organization side. So I encourage you to continue to grow your PFA programs um, so that you can reap the benefits of all of their insights. And if you have any questions about how UW Health does this, I'm happy to answer. If you have anything to share with me about how you do things differently that I can learn from, please also contact me because I would love to learn from other organizations. 
And I just want to thank you guys for your time today, and um, I invite you to reach out if you ever need anything. Thank you, Jenna. And thank you for watching the webinar today. If you have not already done so, you can go ahead and watch the first two webinar recordings in our Patient and Family Engagement webinar series. Uh, the titles are Patient and Family Advisor Volunteer Management, Part 1, Recruitment, Screening, Interviewing, and Database, and Part 2, Orientation, Retention, Strategies, and Recognition Options. Each recording does run about 45 minutes and can be accessed on our WHA Quality Center website under the Partnership for Patients, Patient and Family Engagement page, where you will find a icon labeled um, with the webinars. Also, if you have any other questions or comments, as Jenna mentioned, you can contact her, or you can also contact me at WHA at jlindwall at WHA.org. Thank you.